The Signalman, by Charles Dickens. Chapter One: A Strange Meeting. Hello. When I called the signalman, I was above him on the hill, but he did not look up. He looked along the railway line towards the tunnel. Hello, down there. I called again. Then he looked up and saw me. Where's the path? I asked. How can I come down and speak to you? He did not answer me. Just then, a train came out of the tunnel. The signalman had a flag in his hand, and he showed it when the train passed. Again, I asked him where the path was. He pointed his flag at the hill. And I saw a path that went down. All right, thanks. I shouted. I went down the wet path. The signalman was waiting for me at the bottom of the hill. He was standing between the railway lines with a strange, nervous expression on his face. The place was quiet and lonely. High walls blocked out a lot of the sky. So there was not much sun there, and it was dark. I looked along the line and saw a red light in front of the entrance to the black tunnel. Then I went up to the signalman, but he moved away from me. He looked at me strangely. It's very lonely here, I said. You don't get many visitors.、Uh, am I disturbing you? He did not answer, but looked at the red light near the tunnel. Why are you watching that light? I asked. Is that part of your job? He answered quietly. Don't you know it is? Suddenly, the horrible idea came to me that he was a ghost, not a man. So I moved away. But then I saw fear in his eyes. Are you afraid of me? I asked. I was thinking, perhaps I've seen you before. Where? He pointed to the red light. There. Why? I've never been there before. No. Perhaps you haven't. Then he began to relax. He took me into his signal box. Have you got much work to do here? I asked. No, not very much, but I have to be very attentive and careful. He replied. What are your responsibilities? I change the signal, pull these switches, and check that the red light is working. He explained. Do you ever feel lonely? I asked. No, I'm used to it. Can't you ever go out into the sunlight? Yes, sometimes when the weather is good, but I must always listen for the electric bell and watch the red light. I looked around his signal box. There was a fire, a desk, a telegraph machine for receiving and sending messages, and a little electric bell. When I was a young man, I studied science. He told me. The bell suddenly rang. He received messages and sent replies. Then he showed his flag when a train passed. He did everything very precisely. During our conversation, he opened the door twice and looked at the red light. He came back to the fire with an anxious expression. I wanted to know why, so I asked. Are you a happy man? I was happy once, he replied. But now I'm worried, sir. Why? What's the problem? It's difficult to say. If you come again, I'll try and tell you, he said. When shall I come? I'll be here again at ten o'clock tomorrow night, sir. I'll come at eleven then, I replied. It was dark outside, 
so he showed me to the path with his light. Don't call out, hello, again, please, he said. All right. And don't call out when you come tomorrow night. Why did you shout, hello down there, tonight, he asked. I don't know. Did I say those exact words? Yes. I know those words very well. I think I said them because I saw you down here, I said. Is that the only reason? Yes, of course. Why? You don't think there was any supernatural reason? He asked. No. Then we said good night, and I returned to my hotel. Chapter 2 Danger I arrived at eleven the following night. The signalman was waiting for me with his light. You see, I didn't call out, I said, smiling. We walked to the signal box and sat down by the fire. I've decided to tell you what disturbs me, he began in a quiet voice. Yesterday evening, I thought you were somebody else. Who? I asked. I don't know. Does he look like me? I've never seen his face, because his left arm is always in front of it. He waves his right arm, like this. And he waved violently, like somebody trying to say, Please get out of the way. One night, continued the signalman, the moon was shining and I was sitting here. Suddenly I heard a voice. Hello down there. I went to the door and looked out. There was somebody by the red light near the tunnel, and he was waving. Look out! Look out! he shouted. And then again, Hello down there! Look out! I took my lamp and ran towards him. What's wrong? What's happened? I called. I wondered why he had his arm in front of his eyes. As I came near him, I put out my hand to pull his arm away. But he wasn't there. Did he go into the tunnel? I asked. No. I ran into the tunnel. I stopped and shone my lamp around. But there was nobody there. I, I was scared, so I ran out fast and came to my box. I sent a telegraph message. Alarm received. Is anything wrong? The answer came back. All well. I said that the person was probably a hallucination. Wait a moment, sir, the signalman said, touching my arm. Six hours later, a terrible accident happened on this line. They brought a lot of dead and injured people out of the tunnel. But it was only a coincidence, I said. A very strange coincidence. Excuse me, but I haven't finished yet, sir. I'm sorry, I replied. This was a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I recovered from the shock. Then one morning at dawn, I saw the ghost again. Did it call out? I asked. No. It was silent. Did it wave its arm? No. It had its hands in front of its face. Like this. He covered his face with his hands. Did you go up to it? No. I came in and sat down very frightened, he said. When I went back to the door, the ghost was gone. And afterwards? Did anything happen this time? I asked again. Yes. That day a train came out of the tunnel, and I saw in a carriage window a lot of people standing up, looking agitated. I gave a signal to the driver to stop. When the train stopped, I ran to it and heard terrible screams. 
A beautiful young lady was dying in one of the carriages. They brought her here and put her down on the floor between us. I pushed back my chair in horror. It's true, sir. That's exactly what happened. Now listen and you'll understand why I'm worried. The ghost came back a week ago, and I've seen it again two or three times. Is it always at the red light? I asked. Yes. The danger light. What does it do? It waves. Like this, he replied. He repeated the movements that expressed the words, Please get out of the way. Then he continued. I have no peace or rest. It calls me many times. Hello down there. Look out! And it rings my bell. Did it ring your bell yesterday when I was here? I asked him. Twice, he replied. Oh, it's your imagination. I was looking at the bell and listening for it, but it only rang when the station called you. The signalman shook his head. No, the ghost's ring is different. You didn't see or hear it, but I did. And was the ghost there when you looked out? Yes, twice. Will you come to the door with me and look for it now? He came to the door and I opened it. Can you see it? I asked. No, it's not there. Right, I said. We went in, shut the door, and sat down. Now I was certain that the ghost did not exist. I think you understand, he said, that I'm disturbed by one question. What does the ghost mean? No, I don't understand you. What is the ghost warning me about? What is the danger? Where is it? Some horrible disaster is going to happen, but what can I do? I can't send a telegraph to the station. What can I say? Message. Danger. Take care. Answer. What danger? Where? Message. Don't know, but be careful. They'll think I'm mad. The poor signalman looked very worried. He pushed his fingers into his black hair. Then he took his handkerchief and wiped his face and hands. Why doesn't the ghost tell me where the accident will happen? Why doesn't it tell me how I can prevent it? Why didn't it say that the beautiful young lady was in danger? My God, I'm only a poor signalman. Why me? I tried to calm him down. I said he must do his duty well, as correctly as possible, and that was all. He became calm after a while, and I offered to stay with him for the night. No, it's all right. Thank you, he said. Come back an hour after sunset tomorrow. I left him at two o'clock in the morning. In my hotel room, I thought about what to do. The signalman was intelligent, careful, and correct in his work, but the situation disturbed him very much. How could he continue to do his job well? So I finally decided to take him to the best doctor in town. The next evening, I went out early. It was nearly sunset when I reached the path above the railway. I had another hour before the signalman came, so I decided to go for a walk. But as I looked down at the railway, I saw a man at the tunnel. He had his left arm in front of his eyes, and he was waving violently. I cannot describe my horror, but it passed when I saw that the man was not a ghost. He was a real person, and there were some other men not far away from him. 
the red light was not shining. Near it was a small object like a bed, covered with a sheet. I ran down the path very fast. What's the matter? I asked the men. The signalman is dead, sir. One of them said. What? The man I know? If you know him, you recognize him. And the man pulled back the sheet. Oh, how did this happen? I cried, recognizing the dead signalman. The man at the tunnel came forward and spoke. A train knocked him down and killed him this morning. It was just getting light. The train came out of the tunnel, and he was standing with his lamp near the line, with his back to the train. Show the gentleman, Tom. I'm the train driver, sir. Tom said. I saw the signalman as I came towards the end of the tunnel. There was no time to slow down. He didn't hear my whistle, so I shouted very loudly. What did you say? I said, "Hello, down there! Look out! Look out! Please get out of the way!" I called to him many times, and I put this arm in front of my eyes because I didn't want to see, and I waved this arm. Like this, but it was too late. Ligeia, by Edgar Allan Poe. Chapter One: A Beautiful Wife. I cannot remember how, when, or where I met Ligeia. It was a long time ago, and my memory is not good. But I think I met her first in a large old city near the Rhine in Germany. She told me that she came from an ancient family. But I never knew the family name of the woman who was my friend, my partner in my studies, and finally my wife. Why did I never discover her family name? Perhaps because she did not want me to find out. But I cannot remember. I remember one thing very well. Ligeia was tall and slim. Later, at the end, she became very thin. How can I describe her quiet, aristocratic movements or the strange softness of her footsteps? If she came into my office, I only knew she was there when I heard her voice, or when she put her white hand on my shoulder. She had a beautiful face, but it was not a classical kind of beauty. There was something strange about it. I have often tried to understand it. Was it her pure white skin or her thick black hair? I looked at her long, delicate nose many times. It was perfect. I looked at her sweet mouth. How soft and red it was! And when she smiled, her teeth were white. Then I looked into her eyes. They were much bigger than normal eyes. Sometimes, when she was excited, they looked like a deer's eyes. They were black with long black eyelashes and black eyebrows. But as I looked into them, I realized that they had a strange expression. I thought about it for many hours, sometimes all night. What was the expression in those eyes? I wanted to know. Many times I thought I almost had the answer, but then it was gone. Ligeia was very determined. She was always calm and quiet, but her determination showed in her eyes. It shone like a terrible energy. And sometimes it frightened me. Ligeia was very clever. She was excellent at Latin and Greek, and she knew many other languages perfectly. She never made a mistake. She was also a student of science and mathematics. When we were first married, I often asked her for help with my studies, and we worked together. But after she died, I was alone. Without her, I was like a child in the dark. When she first became ill, she did not come to help me as often as before. 
She lost weight, and her skin became pale and transparent. When I saw that she was dying, I felt desperate. Lygia resisted death with all her energy. She was determined to live. I watched in agony as she fought for life. I knew she loved me, but I only understood how much she loved me now that she was dying. She held my hands and said that she was devoted to me. I cannot talk about it now, but let me say that her love for me was part of her determination to live. On the night she died, she suddenly got out of bed and cried, "Oh God, must I die? Must I lose my fight with death? No, I can't die like this." But my dear Lygia died. I was so sad I could not stay in the old city by the Rhine. For a few months, I travelled around. Then I bought an old abbey in an isolated part of England. This dark, sad place expressed my feelings of loneliness, but I decorated it with beautifully coloured curtains, carpets, and ornaments. I said to myself, "Perhaps the bright colours will make me feel happier." Unfortunately, they did not. I began to drink too much, but I do not want to speak about that time of my life. I will only say that one day I married Lady Rowena Trevanion of Tremaine. My new wife had blonde hair and blue eyes. She was very different from my first wife. But how could I ever forget Lygia? Chapter Two: A Fight with Death. I took Lady Rowena back to a room high up in the tower of the Abbey, where we lived for the first month of our marriage. The room was very large, with an enormous window made of glass from Venice. The ceiling was high, like a church, and in the center there was a big gold chandelier. There were sofas from the east and an Indian bed. On the walls were long tapestries, like carpets, with designs made of gold. The tapestries moved every time the wind blew. My wife was afraid of me, because I was often sad and depressed. She did not love me much, and stayed away from me, but I preferred this. I always thought about Lygia, my beautiful Lygia, dead in the tomb. Sometimes in my dreams, I called to her in the night. I imagined that perhaps my love for her could bring her back to me. At the beginning of the second month. Lady Rowena became ill. She did not sleep very well, and told me she could hear sounds and movements in the tower. "You have a fever," I said. "You're imagining things." She got better, but then she went back to bed with a second illness, worse than the first. The doctors could not understand it. Again, Rowena began to hear little sounds and movements in the bedroom. And they frightened her. One night at the end of September, she woke up suddenly. I was sitting on a sofa by her bed. She whispered to me that she could hear sounds and see movements, and there was a frightened expression on her thin face. But I saw and heard nothing. It's the wind, I explained. You can see the tapestries moving in the wind. But her face was white with fear. And she nearly fainted. I remember that there was some wine on the table on the other side of the room. As I walked under the light of the chandelier, a strange thing happened. I felt something invisible pass me, and on the carpet I saw a shadow, almost the shadow of a shadow. I decided to say nothing to Rowena. I poured out a glass of wine and gave it to her. Then I sat on the sofa and watched her. After some moments, I heard very quiet footsteps on the carpet, coming towards the bed. A second later, as Rowena was about to drink the wine, I saw, or perhaps I dreamed that I saw, three or four large drops of a bright red liquid fall into the glass. 
Rowena did not see it. She drank the wine, and I said nothing because I thought it was only my imagination. After this, Rowena's health got much worse, and on the third night she died. Her servants prepared her for the tomb, then covered her with a sheet. The next night, I sat alone with her body in the bedroom. Strange forms and shadows moved around me. I looked nervously into the dark corners at the moving tapestries, and I felt frightened. Then I looked at the carpet under the chandelier. There was no shadow there, and I felt better. When I looked at Rowena on the bed, sad memories of Lygia, the only woman I ever loved, came back to me. It was perhaps around midnight when I heard a sound. It was quiet but clear, and it woke me from my dreams. I thought it came from the bed. I listened in terror, but I did not hear it again. I looked carefully at Rowena for any sign of life. She was not moving, but I continued to look at her. Minutes passed. Then I noticed a little color in Rowena's face. My heart stopped in horror. I could not move. When I understood that Rowena was not dead, I tried to revive her. But soon the color disappeared from her cheeks. Her face looked like marble again, and her lips were thin with the horrible expression of death. When her body was cold and rigid, I fell onto the sofa and dreamed about Lygia. An hour later, I heard the same sound as before. I listened. Yes, there it was again, a sigh from the bed. I ran over and saw clearly that her lips were trembling. Then they opened, showing her bright teeth. I thought I was going mad. There was a pink color on her cheeks and neck. Her body was getting warm again, and her heart was beating a little. Lady Rowena was alive. I did everything I could to revive her. Then suddenly, her color disappeared. Her heart stopped, and her body became cold and rigid. I sat down and began to think about Lygia again. Then again, for the third time, there was a sound from the bed. But why must I describe the horrors of that night? Again, I tried to revive Rowena. And then a fourth time, each time she seemed to fight with an invisible force, and each time her body changed. I cannot say how, but she looked different. It was nearly dawn when she moved again. I was sitting on the sofa, exhausted, but Rowena's body moved with more energy than before. Her color returned, signs of life changed her face. Her eyes were closed. But she looked alive. Then she suddenly got out of bed and walked slowly to the center of the room, like she was walking in her sleep. I did not tremble. I did not move. I was as cold and still as stone, paralyzed by what I saw. As I looked at her, my head filled with wild thoughts. Was Rowena really alive? Could I really see her blonde hair and blue eyes? Why wasn't I certain? I could not see her mouth very well, but her cheeks were like pink roses. Weren't they Rowena's cheeks? But wasn't she taller than before? I was filled with a kind of madness. I ran to her, but she moved away. Then I saw her long hair moving in the wind. It was blacker than the black of midnight, and now slowly her eyes opened. I shouted like a madman. These are the black eyes of my lost love, the eyes of Lygia. In the dark, by E. Nesbit. Chapter One: A Shocking Confession. Maybe he was mad. Maybe he had a sixth sense. Or was he really haunted? He told me the first part of the story. And I saw the last part with my own eyes. At school, 
My friend Haldane and I hated a boy called Vizga. When we did something wrong, he always told the teacher. One day we stole some cherries from a tree. Do you know who did it, Vizga? The teacher asked. It was Haldane and Winston, he replied. Later, Haldane asked him how he knew it was us. I didn't know, he said. I just felt certain, and I was right. Haldane and I grew up. Vizga became a vegetarian and never drank alcohol. He also became Sir George Vizga. When we all left Oxford University, I went away to India. After a year, I came back and wanted to see Haldane. He was always happy, kind, and honest. I wanted to see the smile in his blue eyes again and hear his happy laugh, so I went to visit him in London. But this time, he did not laugh. He was miserable. His face was pale, and he looked weak and ill. He was packing his things, and there were lots of big boxes full of furniture and books around the house. I'm moving, he said. I don't like this house. There's something strange about it. I'm going tomorrow. Let's go out and have some dinner, I said. I'm too busy. He looked nervously around the room. Look, I'm really happy to see you, but why don't you go to the restaurant and bring back some food? When I came back, we sat by the fire and ate the food. I tried to tell jokes and he tried to laugh, but sometimes he looked into the shadows in the corners of the room. We finished our meal, and then I said, "Well, what's the matter?" "You tell me," I answered. He was silent. Again, he looked into the shadows. You're very nervous," I said. "What is it? Drink, gambling, women? Tell me, or go and tell your doctor. You're ill, my friend. I won't be your friend if you talk like that. Well, I am your friend, and something is wrong. Come on, tell me. But he did not tell me anything. He asked me to stay for the night, but I had a room in a hotel, so I left him. When I returned the next morning, he was gone, and some men were putting his boxes into a van. Haldane did not leave his new address. I saw him again more than a year later. He came to see me early one morning before breakfast. He looked really bad, worse than before. His face was thin and white, like a ghost, and his hands were shaking. I invited him to have breakfast with me, but I did not ask him any questions because I knew he wanted to tell me something. I made coffee, talked, and waited. I'm going to kill myself. He began. Don't worry. I won't do it here or now. I'll do it when it's necessary. When I can't continue to live any more, and I want somebody to know why, can I tell you? Yes, of course. I said, astonished. You must promise not to tell anybody while I'm alive. He said. I promise. He looked at the fire silently. It's difficult to begin. He said. You remember George Visger, don't you? Yes, I haven't seen him for a long time, but somebody told me he went to an island to teach vegetarianism to the cannibals. I laughed. Anyway, he's gone. Haldane did not laugh. Yes, he's gone, but not to an island. He's dead. Dead? How? You remember he always knew when people did bad things and told the teacher. Well, he told a girl some bad things about me. I loved her, but she left me. Then she died suddenly. Oh, it was terrible. When I went to the funeral, he was there. I came back home and sat thinking about it, and then he arrived. I hope you told him to go away.
I said angrily. No, I listened to him. He came to say it was better that she was dead and, and we hadn't got married. I asked why, and he said because there was madness in my family. And is there? I don't know. But he said he knew and had told my girlfriend. I said I never knew anything about madness in the family. And he said, so, you see, it's better you didn't get married, isn't it? And then I put my hands round his neck. I don't know if I meant to kill him, but that's what happened. I was shocked. I said nothing. What can you say when your friend tells you he is a murderer? Haldane continued. I saw that he was dead, but I was very calm. I sat down and thought, there's no blood, no weapon. Everybody knows Visgar is going to an island. And he told me he said goodbye to them. So there's no problem. I must get rid of his body, that's all. How? He smiled. No, I won't tell you. You promise not to tell anybody. But maybe you'll talk in your sleep or when you have a fever one day. I'll be safe if you don't know where the body is. Do you see? I was sorry for my friend, but I could not believe he was a murderer. I said, yes, I see. Look, let's go away together. Let's travel and see the world and forget about Visga. He looked very happy. You understand and you don't hate me. Why didn't I tell you before? It's too late now. Too late? No, it isn't. Come on, we'll pack our suitcases tonight. We'll go where nobody can find us. He said, When I tell you what has happened to me, you'll change your mind. But I know what has happened to you. No, he said slowly. I've told you what happened to him, not what happened to me. That's very different. Did I tell you what his last words were? Just before I put my hands around his neck, he said, Careful, Haldane, you'll never get rid of my body. Well, I got rid of his body, and I forgot about his last words. But a year later, I was sitting here, and I suddenly remembered them. I got rid of your body very easily, Visgar, I said. And then I looked at the carpet in front of the fire and... Ah! Haldane screamed very loudly. I can't tell you. No, I can't. Chapter 2 A Haunted Man At that moment we heard thunder outside. I went to the window and saw some dark storm clouds in the sky. Where was I? Haldane said. Oh, yes. I looked at the carpet and there he was... Visgar, I can't explain it. The door was closed, the windows were closed. He wasn't there before, and he was there now. That's all. A hallucination, I said. That's exactly what I thought, he answered. But I touched it. It was real. It was heavy and hard, like stone. The arms were rigid like the arms of a statue. It was a hallucination, I repeated. Well, I thought somebody had put him here to frighten me. So I went to the place where I had hidden him, and he was there, just as he was a year before. My dear Haldane, I said, this is very funny. You might think it's funny, but when I wake up in the night and think of it, it isn't funny at all. I don't want to die in the dark, Winston. That's why I think I'll kill myself, so I'm sure that I won't die in the dark. Is that all? No, he came back again. I was asleep on the train one day, and when I woke up, he was on the seat opposite me. He looked the same as before, hard and rigid like a statue. I threw him out of the window in the tunnel. If I see him again, I'll kill myself. You think I'm mad, but I'm not. You can't help me. Nobody can help me. He knew, you see. He said, you'll never get rid of my body, and I can't. He always knew things. Winston, I promise you I'm not mad. I don't think you're mad. I think your mind is disturbed. But we'll stay together. 
If you can talk to me, you won't imagine things. So we went travelling together, and I was full of hope. Haldane was always a rational man, and I could not believe he was mad. I wanted to help him get better. After a month or two, the madness passed, and we joked and laughed again. I was extremely happy that my old friend was normal. He's forgotten about Visga, I thought, and now he's fine. We arrived in Bruges, where there was a big exhibition, and all the hotels were full. We could only find one room with a single bed in a hotel called the Grande Vigne, so I had to sleep in the armchair. We had dinner and went to a pub, and it was late when we returned to our room. We talked for a while, and then Haldane got into bed. I tried to sleep in the armchair, but it was not very comfortable. I was nearly asleep when Haldane began to talk about his will. I've left everything to you, Winston, he said. I know I can trust you to take care of everything. Uh, th thank you, I said sleepily. Let's talk about it in the morning. But he continued, telling me what a good friend I was. I told him to go to sleep, but he said he was thirsty. Oh, all right, I said. Light the candle and go and get some water. And then, please let me sleep. No, you light it. I don't want to get out of bed in the dark. I might step on something or walk into something that wasn't there when I got into bed. I lit the candle, and he sat up in bed and looked at me. His face was very pale, his hair untidy, and his eyes were shining. That's better, he said. Oh, look here. There are two big letters on the sheet in red cotton. G. V. George Visger. No. It's the symbol of the Hotel Grande Vigne, I said. Hurry up and get the water. Please come with me, Winston. I'll go down by myself. And I went to the door with the candle in my hand. He jumped off the bed in a second. No, I don't want to stay alone in the dark, he said, like a frightened child. I tried to make a joke of it, but I was very disappointed. It was clear to me that all my time spent trying to help him had been wasted, and that he was not better after all. We went down as quietly as we could, and got some water from the dining room. Haldane took the candle from me, and went very slowly back towards our room. He looked round very carefully. I knew what he was looking for, and I became angry and nervous. When we entered the room, I almost expected to see something on the carpet, but of course there was nothing. I put out the candle, pulled the blankets around me, and tried to get comfortable in my chair so I could sleep again. You've got all the blankets, Haldane said. No, I haven't. Only the ones I had before. Well, I can't find mine. I'm so cold. Light the candle. Quick, light it. There's something horrible... But I could not find the matches. Light the candle, light the candle, he shouted. If you don't, he'll come to me. He'll come in the dark. I can't die in the dark. Please, Winston, light the candle. I am lighting it, I said angrily. But in the dark I was trying to find the matches with my hands. On the shelf, the table, I could not remember where I had put them. You're not going to die. It's all right. I'll get the matches in a second. It's cold, it's cold, it's cold, he said, like that, three times. And then he screamed loudly, like a child or like a rabbit attacked by dogs. What is it? I cried. There was silence. Then, very slowly, It's Visga, he said, and his voice seemed strange and distant. Of course it isn't. My hand found the matches as I spoke. He's here! He screamed. Here, next to me, in the bed! I lit the candle. I ran to the bed. He was lying on the edge of the bed. Next to him was a dead man, 
white and cold. Haldane had died in the dark. There was a simple explanation. Haldane and I were in the wrong room, the dead man's room. His name was Félix Leblanc, and he had died from a heart attack earlier that day. I found out more information in England. The police found the body of a man with a bottle of poison in his hand in a railway tunnel. His name was Simmons, and he had drunk poison in Haldane's carriage because he was depressed. Haldane had thrown his body out of the window. Haldane left me all his possessions in his will. I asked a police inspector to be with me when I opened the boxes he had left me. Inside one were the bodies of two men. One man was identified later. He was a salesman who had died of epilepsy. The other body was Vizca's. I leave it to you to explain the events in this story. I cannot find an explanation that satisfies me. The Upper Birth by F. Marion Crawford Chapter 1 The Mystery of Cabin 105 We were all tired after a long dinner one evening, but nobody wanted to go home. Then somebody shouted, Bring the cigars! It was Brisbane, a big, strong man. Everybody turns to look at him. Lighting his cigar, he said, It's strange, you know. We all stopped talking. It's strange, he said again. People are always asking if anyone's seen a ghost. Well, I have. Somebody said, Tell us the story, Brisbane. We lit our cigars, ordered another bottle of champagne, and listened to his story. When I used to travel to America, I liked to sail on certain ships. The Kamchatka used to be my favourite. It isn't my favourite now, and I never want to travel on it again. I remember it was a warm morning in June. When I went on board, I told the steward the number of my cabin, 105. He nearly dropped my suitcase. Well... God help you, he said quietly. I thought he might be drunk, but I said nothing and followed him. Cabin 105 was a large room with two berths with curtains around them. Mine was the lower one. That morning the cabin seemed empty and depressing, and I didn't like it. I gave the steward some money, and he thanked me. I'll try to make you comfortable he said, and then added quietly, If that's possible in this cabin. I was surprised, but again I thought he was drunk. I was wrong. Our voyage began. On the first day everything was normal. That night I was tired and went to my cabin early. I noticed another suitcase by the door and a walking stick and an umbrella in the berth above mine. I wasn't happy, because I had wanted to be on my own. Who was my companion? I decided to stay awake and see. Later, I was lying in bed in the dark when he came in. He was tall, very thin and pale, with fair hair and a beard and grey eyes. He looked like the type of man who makes money on Wall Street or by gambling. I decided I didn't want to talk to him. If he gets up early, I'll get up late, I said to myself before I went to sleep. During the night, a loud noise suddenly woke me up. It was the other man jumping out of bed. Then I heard him unlock the cabin door. He ran out very fast, leaving the door open. I heard his footsteps along the passage. 
I got up angrily to close the door, and went back to sleep. When I woke up, it was still dark. The air was damp, and I felt cold. There was a strange smell in the cabin, like old sea water. I could hear the other man moving in the berth above mine. So, he's come back, I thought. Then he made a low sound of pain, and I thought he was feeling seasick. Then I fell asleep. When I woke up again, the cabin was still cold. Suddenly, I noticed that the window was open, so I got up and closed it. The curtains were closed around the other berth, so I thought the man was asleep. The smell of seawater had disappeared. At about seven o'clock, I went for a walk around the ship, and I met the ship's doctor from Ireland, a young man with black hair, blue eyes, and a happy face. I said the weather was not very good. It was very cold last night. I continued, but my window was open all night, and the room was damp. Damp? Where is your cabin? It's cabin one o five. The ship's doctor looked at me with big eyes. I asked, "What was the matter?" "Oh, nothing," he answered. "Well, I'll tell you. Everybody has complained about that room on our last three trips. Good, and I'm going to complain too. But I believe there's something.、Uh, no, I mustn't frighten you. Oh." You won't frighten me. If I get a bad cold, I'll come to you. We laughed, and I offered him a cigar. Then he asked me if I had a roommate. Yes, a strange man who runs out in the middle of the night and leaves the door open. The ship's doctor gave me a curious look. Did he come back? Yes, he was there when I woke up. Look. My cabin is big enough for four people. You can sleep there tonight. I was really surprised. Why was he so anxious about me? I thanked him and said my cabin was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. We doctors aren't superstitious, he said, but please don't sleep in one o five. Come and stay in my cabin. But why? Because the last three people who slept there went overboard. I looked at him to see if he was joking, but he looked very serious. I said, "I really don't think I'll be the fourth person to go overboard." I think you'll change your mind before we arrive in America," he said. After breakfast, I went to my cabin to get a book. The curtains around my roommate's berth were still closed, so I thought he was asleep. As I came out, I met the steward, who said the captain wanted to see me in his cabin. I want to ask you a favour," said the captain when I arrived. "Your roommate has disappeared. Did you notice anything strange about him? Has he gone overboard?" I asked. Remembering the ship doctor's story, yes, I think so. That's incredible. He's the fourth person, and I told him the story of cabin one o five. I also told him what had happened to me in the night. That's the same story the other roommates told me. The captain said, nobody saw the man last night. The steward found his berth empty this morning and looked for him, but he's disappeared. Please don't tell the other passengers. I don't want my ship to get a bad reputation for suicide. You can sleep in any cabin you like for the rest of the voyage. Is that all right? Thank you, Captain. But my cabin is empty now, so I'll stay there. The captain tried to change my mind. But I told him I was happy to have the room to myself. I asked him if the steward could remove my roommate's things, 
and do something about the damp and the window. After I left the captain, I saw the ship's doctor, and we played cards. I went to my room late. Chapter two. The cabin of terror. In my cabin, I thought of the tall man now dead somewhere in the ocean, and I opened the curtains around his berth. It was empty. Suddenly, I noticed that the window was open and secured with a hook. Angry, I went to look for the steward. I showed him the window. Why is it open? I shouted. I'll report you to the captain. The steward was frightened, and he closed the window. Nobody can keep this window closed at night, sir. Look, is that locked or not? You try it and see, please. The window was securely locked. Well, you'll see that in half an hour it'll be open again, and secured too. That's the horrible thing, sir. It is secured with the hook. I checked the window again. If I find it open in the night, I'll give you ten pounds. But it's impossible. We said good night, and I went to bed. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. Sometimes I looked at the window. It was closed, and I smiled, thinking of the steward's story. As I was falling asleep, I suddenly felt some cold air and sea water on my face. I jumped out of bed, and the movement of the ship threw me onto the sofa under the window. It was open, and secured with the hook. I was surprised, but not scared. I closed the window and locked it. Then I stood watching it in the dark cabin. Suddenly, I heard a sound behind me and turned round. A sound of pain came from the berth above mine. I opened the curtains and put my hands in. There was somebody in it. The air was very damp, and there was a horrible smell of old sea water. I touched a man's arm. It was wet and as cold as ice. As I pulled it, the thing came towards me, a soft, wet, heavy thing. And it fell against me. I fell back across the cabin. In a moment, the door opened and the thing ran out. I followed it as fast as possible. I'm sure I saw it in the low light of the corridor before it disappeared. Now, I was really frightened. This is crazy. I thought. Had I really seen it? I went back into the cabin, lit a candle. And saw with horror that the window was open. I looked at the other berth. It smelt of sea water, but it was dry. I closed the window and sat on the sofa all night. The window did not open. When dawn came, I got dressed and went on deck, where I saw the ship's doctor. You were right, doctor. I said. There's something very strange about cabin one o five. Did you have a bad night? He asked. So I told him everything. Then I asked if he believed me. Yes, of course. You must come and stay in my cabin tonight. Why don't you come and stay in mine for one night? Help me to understand what happened. I'm sorry, but no, I don't want to see any ghosts. I laughed at him. <laughs> Do you really believe it was a ghost? Can you explain it then? He asked angrily. No, you can't. But you're a doctor, a man of science. You must know there's a rational explanation. There isn't a rational explanation. I hope you find somebody to help you. Good morning, Mr. Brisbane. And the ship's doctor continued his walk. I didn't want to spend another night in my cabin, but I was obstinate and decided to do it alone. 
I couldn't find anybody to help me. Later, I met the captain and told him this. I'll stay with you tonight, he said, and we'll see what happens. I think we can find out what's wrong with that berth. He brought a carpenter to the cabin and told him to examine the berth very carefully. When the carpenter finished his work, he said, "In my opinion, it's better to lock the door with some big screws. Four people have died already. This cabin is haunted." I'll try it for one more night," I answered. I was feeling better now because I had the captain's company for the night. He was a calm, brave man, and he really wanted to solve the mystery. I was smoking a cigar at about ten o'clock that evening when he came to speak to me. This is a serious problem, Mister Brisbane," he said. "We've lost four passengers on four trips." So we must find out what's wrong. If nothing happens tonight, we'll try tomorrow. Are you ready? We went down to cabin one o five. The captain closed the door and locked it. He put my big suitcase in front of the door and sat on it, so nothing could get out. The window was closed. I opened the curtains around the other berth and put my lamp there. Then I checked around the cabin and under my bed and the sofa. Nobody can come into the cabin, nobody can open the window, and only you and I are in the cabin. I said. Very good, answered the captain calmly. So. If we see anything, it's only our imagination, or something supernatural. <sighs> Do you really believe it's something supernatural? I asked sleepily. No, I don't. What are you looking at? I didn't answer. I was looking at the window. Was the lock? Really beginning to turn, or was it my imagination? Yes, perhaps it was. Very slowly, so slowly that I wasn't really sure. It's moving, the captain cried. But what's that smell? I can smell old sea water. Can you? Yes, it's strange because the cabin is dry. I said. Just then, my lamp suddenly went out. As I stood up to get it, the captain jumped up with a loud cry of surprise. I turned and ran towards him as he called for help. He was trying to stop the window from opening, but the lock was turning against his hands. Suddenly, the window opened. The captain, his face very pale, stood by the door so nobody could escape. There's somebody in that berth! He shouted, his eyes big and scared. Stand by the door while I look. It won't escape. But I jumped up and put my hands into the upper berth. Inside there was something ghostly and horrible, and it moved in my hands. It felt like the body of a drowned man, cold, soft, and wet from a long time in the water. I held on to it tightly. But it was as strong as ten men, and it moved—a smooth, wet thing with a putrid smell and dead white eyes that stared at me, and wet hair over its dead face. It pushed against me, put its arms around my neck, and forced me back. I fought with the thing, but it was too strong, and finally I fell and let it go. It moved quickly towards the captain. He tried to hit it. But he fell down with a cry of horror. As the thing stood over the captain, I almost screamed with terror, but I had no voice. Suddenly, the thing disappeared. It seemed to go through the window, but I don't know how that was possible. The captain and I lay on the floor for a long time. When I moved at last, I knew my arm was broken. I stood up, 
and tried to help the captain. He wasn't injured, but he was in a bad state of shock. That's the end of my story. The ship's carpenter put four big screws in the door of 105, and no passengers slept in it again. If you ever travel on the Kamshaka and ask for that cabin, the captain will tell you that it's occupied. Yes, it is occupied by a dead thing.